Adapting has been the name of the game since the coronavirus pandemic started. That's certainly been the case for primary care doctors. Today on Being Well, we're talking with Dr. Navi Aurora of Effingham Prompt Care about the challenges he's faced and what the future of primary care could look like. So stay tuned. For over 50 years, Horizon Health has been keeping you and your family healthy. And although some things have changed, Horizon Health's commitment to meet the ever-changing needs of our community has remained the same. Horizon Health, 50 years strong. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances the ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. Thank you so much for joining us today for Being Well. I'm your host, Lacey Spence, and today we are talking about another topic related to COVID-19 and its primary care in a pandemic. So joining us today, we've got Dr. Navi Aurora from Effingham Prompt Care. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now, as a first time guest of the show, before we dive into our topic, what got you into what you're doing? So I was born and raised in Effingham. Uh, my parents were both physicians there and watching them take care of people basically my whole life uh, made me want to become a physician just like them. And so you said that you were, um, you actually studied pretty close to home as well. Yes. So I did my residency at Southern Illinois University and Springfield. Um, I completed that in internal medicine and then I moved back home to work with my parents um, in 2013. Perfect. And so I know Central Illinois is glad to have you back in this area mm -hmm. serving everyone. And so today our topic, um, primary care during a pandemic. So first off, what have you noticed um, since this pandemic started? So Every facet of healthcare has changed because of this pandemic. Um, you know, ER utilization is down, um, elective surgeries uh, were canceled, um, and primary care has been affected as well. Um, patients, understandably, have been worried to go uh, see their regular doctor for primary care services. Um, so we've had to, um, you know, adapt uh, in the past few months. Um, one of the biggest ways we've done that is through telemedicine. Um, telemedicine has really been a game changer in a lot of specialty care, um, such as neurology and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. But we've been slow to adapt um, and um, offer telemedicine services in this area uh, however, the pandemic has forced us to do so, and we found that, you know, it's not only been beneficial for now, but it could also be the future of primary care because patients can see their regular doctor um, in the comfort and privacy of their own home. Um, so it's, it's, there'll definitely be more to come on that in the future. Now, on the other hand, there have been patients that have been comfortable coming into their doctor's offices. And, you know, we've had to change uh, organizational and operational um, practices, and we've had to adjust patient flow. So we've tried to make it as comfortable as we can for patients that still want to come to their doctor's offices, whether it's because of lack of technology or just wanting to see their doctor in person for a more personable uh, visit. So changes we've made, Lacey, are um, 
you know, we've had sick patients come through um, the back door and healthy patients come through the front. Mm -hmm. um, we've been screening people and checking their temperature, asking them about flu-like symptoms, um, and really uh, just triaging um, the best we can. And, you know, in some cases, the, the uh, parking lot has become the new waiting room. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, several of our staff who have gone to get treatment and mm -hmm. one of the things that they notice is the like text when you arrive so that yeah. you're not just waiting in a waiting room. Right, right. And so to back up just a little bit, um, telehealth for our viewers at home who maybe aren't so familiar, uh, what does that look like? What does that entail? So telemedicine or telehealth is the delivery of health care through um, audio and video communications. So that could be the uh, physician or provider being on their um, laptop or desktop computer and using um, a secure platform to communicate, you know, send a message to their patients and then their patients open up the message and um, the doctor can see the patient and vice versa. And you communicate, you know, pretty much like a um, uh, FaceTime phone mm -hmm. call, you know, and interestingly, since this pandemic and uh, the past few months, um, the rules have been um, less lax in terms of what uh, platforms you can use to communicate. So, for example, a lot of my uh, telemedicine calls have been through FaceTime or have been through Skype. Now, that's not quite as secure as um, these other uh, platforms that are sometimes used in conjunction with the EHR, the electronic health record, but um, the insurance companies and the bigger healthcare groups have been more lax uh, because they realize how important it is for that continuity of care. So it's really, it's as simple as, you know, I do my calls on my iPhone and if the patients have an iPhone, we do FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, we have been using this app called Zoom. Mm -hmm. So we try to make it as easy as possible for everyone involved. And as you're talking about safety, um, are there ways that you're able to, I guess, kind of isolate yourself or keep yourself private when that's happening just to ensure that medical info isn't being heard by anybody else? Sure, yeah, so a lot of times we'll conduct the call uh, in an exam room. Mm -hmm. So the primary care physician will be in an exam room just like they would be usually with the patient, but instead they have their laptop um, or their iPhone open and they're just, you know, doing the visit, but it's remotely. And so other than um, regular visits, have there been any other primary care services um, affected by the pandemic? Sure. Um, you know, in primary care, the two main things we manage are uh, chronic diseases and um, preventive medicine. So in terms of chronic diseases, um, if you have a patient with diabetes or high blood pressure and you have patients missing appointments or not coming in, their blood sugar could go high, their blood pressure readings could go high, and that could lead to an increase in heart attacks and strokes. You know, um, another example is if a patient has COPD or asthma. You know, we see those patients pretty regularly to make sure they're on the right inhalers and their symptoms have been controlled. Um, but if they're missing appointments due to the pandemic, they could have an increased frequency or an increased severity of exacerbations and an increased frequency. And God forbid if they um, get infected with COVID-19, it could uh, lead to a more severe infection if their underlying uh, medical conditions aren't well controlled. For patients who have been at home during this and not able to come see you, has their treatment methods at home kind of changed? Have you kind of given them doctor's orders per se? Yeah, yeah. So we've, you know, probably like any 
other primary care practice where we're the first line of defense or the first line of care, um, we've had a huge number of phone calls um, in the past few months. Um, so it, just asking questions about how do we stay safe, um, here's my blood pressure readings, here's my blood sugars, um, could you call us in our medication refills without us coming in? Um, so our nurses have, and our nursing staff has been really busy with that. And you know, in some cases, um, uh, the physicians also get on the phone and talk to the patients and try to um, reassure them that you know everything will be okay. Sometimes that's all patients need is to hear from their doctor. It doesn't always have to be audio-visual um, or a specific appointment. You know, sometimes we just like to pick up the phone and return patients' calls ourselves to make them feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Which is so great that you do because I know from my experience trying to hook up the video call the first time yeah. had a couple issues and I like to consider myself pretty tech savvy. Yeah. So for those who aren't, I, I could see where it would be a little mm -hmm. frustrating. Sure. So what has been the most common question you've gotten from patients during all of this? So patients basically want to know, you know, is this virus real? Um, what caused it, how infectious is it, and you know unfortunately there's a lot of misinformation out there um, especially on social media and um, other um, ways of getting information or the news and that's just kind of the age we live in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of patients just want to um, simply know did, is, did what I read or what I heard from my neighbor or friend, is this true? So we're pretty much, you know, the main thing we've been doing in terms of questions about the pandemic is trying to separate fact from fiction the best we can because, you know, this, this situation is fluid. It changes day to day, uh, week to week, and we want uh, our patients and really the population as a whole to be as well informed as possible so they can make their own decisions um, for what's best for them because different patients have different uh, medical conditions and the different immune systems and so we all have to react the best we can for our own health and the well-being of uh, the whole population. And like you said, it's not one size fits all. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And so just for our viewers at home, we are taping this episode at the end of June. So a lot can change before then. Right. Mm -hmm. um, have you treated any COVID-19 patients yet or seen any? Well, uh, I have not. We've been very fortunate since this started. And I can just speak for um, our practice in Effingham. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really seen too many people with, you know, severe flu-like symptoms, cough, body aches, uh, rash, uh, abnormal GI symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been fortunate in that respect. And you know, Effingham is an interesting community because we have two major interstates that cross through there. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of truck stops and truck drivers that come through. Um, but you know, in my practice, we've been very fortunate so far to not see anybody that's walked in very sick and said, you know, this is, we're concerned about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So we hope that continues. And, you know, if we all do our part in terms of social and physical isolation, uh, mask wearing, um, proper hand hygiene, all those little things, they really do add up. Um, so we just need to keep being as diligent as we can in doing those um, you know, through those important processes. Which I'm so glad to hear that you've not seen any patients and I also hope that trend continues for yeah. you. Um, as we're taping this in June again, there's not a vaccine uh, to treat COVID-19 yet, but do you have any like patient protocol in place that you would um, prescribe or tell them to do if someone did come in with it? 
So um, that's the tricky part right now, uh -huh. and that's really why this uh, pandemic has became a pandemic really and lasted this long is there's no vaccine, there's no treatment. Um, so we've been doing the best we can in terms of supportive care. And um, that's still hard to say because there's, this is still so new. Mm -hmm. There's companies that are trying to develop um, vaccines and treatments and um, there's antibody testing uh, but, you know, it's still too early to tell um, how to treat it or manage it and really what's going to happen in the fall. Yeah. So we just have to do the best we can now and practice uh, social distancing and uh, mask wearing and things like that I mentioned earlier. And it's something that we're also planning to hit um, at other points in this season. But one of the things that you can see immediately would be mental health effects sure. of a pandemic. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so mental health is uh, a topic that I don't think gets enough attention, mm -hmm. uh, even more so during a pandemic. Um, depression and anxiety rates have really increased. Um, since the pandemic, they're really on the rise. And, you know, unfortunately, um, suicide rates are at their highest since World War II. Wow. So primary care is really the front line um, to any um, health care that, that is presented. Um, you know, there's a shortage of psychiatrists. I'm sure you've heard that before. So primary care physicians and providers um, take care of about 70% of mental health conditions. Wow. So we're really the front line um, in terms of diagnosis and treatment of depression and anxiety. And we do the best we can, but we do need those specialists at times, just like any other um, specialist. Um, so we can only do so much. And, you know, half the time what we do is enough, and the other half we need the specialist. But the fact that, you know, the pandemic has closed down so many um, clinics and offices, and uh, including primary care offices, these patients who were already struggling with uh, depression, anxiety, um, suicidal ideations, they were really the most vulnerable because they didn't have anywhere to go. So not only couldn't they see their doctor, but their counseling sessions were canceled. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, if there was a substance abuse, their AA or NA meetings were canceled. So really this pandemic has, been a disaster for their uh, whole support system. So that's really been uh, the frustrating part. And so as we're at the end of June, um, Illinois just opened up to phase four. So we've got a lot more freedom right now. Right. Um, using your crystal ball, if say this fall things get worse and we have to start shutting things down again, are there now more services in place for those who are struggling with mental health that they can access? Sure, that's a good question. Um, the biggest thing I think we'll do better if there's another peak in the curve is uh, better and earlier use of telemedicine. So uh, because before when this started back in March, um, psychiatrists and primary care doctors were slow to offer telemedicine services. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we see that second peak in the fall, um, we'll be quicker to figure out a way to support our patients better, especially those, those very vulnerable populations. And do you see any other changes to primary care this fall besides ramping up that telehealth? Yeah, so what we're going through now, and not only healthcare, but in everyday life, um, this is, you know, I believe going to be our new normal for not just the rest of this year, but maybe, 
you know, for a while. Um, so changes in primary care might include um, something called virtual care. So virtual care, I think, is going to be the new disruptor in primary care. Um, so you can have your primary care physician, but you'll never have to go into the office to see them. So you can make appointments. Um, you can see them through your phone or through a laptop. Um, and it could be really good for the patient's health in some um, circumstances. So for example, if you have a patient with high blood pressure and they're at home monitoring their blood pressures and you see them rising, um, and it's eight weeks later, but their appointment isn't for another month or two, mm -hmm. you can contact the patient. You know, they may be wearing like a remote monitoring device, so you okay. can track their blood pressures in real time. You can contact that patient and titrate their uh, medication over the phone. So they'll have a lower blood pressure um, instead of waiting another month to come into the office, going over this archaic blood pressure log, then making changes. And you know, what virtual care will enable us to do in healthcare is basically to be more proactive, you know? And in the future, I think um, virtual care will get so good that it could maybe even prevent certain illnesses. And as one thing I'm definitely learning as the new host of this show is that time is of the essence when it comes to healthcare. Yes, yes. And so as we head into this fall, um, do you have any predictions on how care might look with folks coming in with the regular flu or just our regular kind of sick season? Sure, so nothing's gonna change from that perspective. Um, you know, primary care um, services, like I mentioned earlier, were really focused on preventative medicine just as much as chronic disease management. So the time you know we start giving flu vaccines in early September that's not going to change you know any other vaccines or preventable uh, illnesses we give that's not going to change now could there be some kind of overlap syndrome between the flu and this novel coronavirus yeah we could see that but you know will the treatment change at this point probably not you know when you have the flu, um, whether it's influenza or this COVID-19, it's important to remember that most people um, just have mild symptoms. You know, you stay in bed, you drink plenty of fluids, mm -hmm. take stuff for um, muscle aches or joint pain, and most people, about 90% get better. So very few people actually get very sick uh, that, and require hospitalization. So our practices, I don't anticipate them changing much, but could there be an overlap syndrome? That's possible. And so in just our last couple of minutes mm -hmm. here, um, for our folks at home who are trying to figure out how to wear the mask properly, how to make sure their hands are clean enough, sure. can you kind of walk us through that? Like, do I need that up over my nose when I'm in the store? Yeah, yeah, you really do because it's important to think about um, the respiratory system mm -hmm. as not just the mouth and down into the lungs. I mean, our sinuses are also part of the respiratory system. So the air we breathe uh, through our nose goes to the same place as it does through our mouth, mm -hmm. both into our lungs. Um, so it's really important to um, make sure the mask you wear um, is over your nose and if they have a bridge make sure you tighten that bridge and you know over the mouth um, and it could be really anything it could be a mask you see you know uh, the doctors wearing like a surgical mask um, it could be a bandana it could be a piece of cloth um, it does not have to be an N95 mask. Those are uh, reserved for healthcare professionals. So it just stops the, the droplets. Yeah, yeah. And um, the mask is basically uh, for something called source control. Okay, so it's basically for 
um, the person wearing the mask to limit their spread of infection. So, you know, some of us could be uh, asymptomatic but still be carrying uh, this novel virus. So basically, if by wearing a mask, we're protecting others. And that's really important to think about. So care for your fellow person, wear the mask, right. wash your hands, and don't touch your face. Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. And we will see you next time for Being Well. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances. The ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home. For over 50 years, Horizon Health has been keeping you and your family healthy. And although some things have changed, Horizon Health's commitment to meet the ever-changing needs of our community has remained the same. Horizon Health, 50 years strong.